everybody and welcome to today's Barnes Takeout. My name is Amy Gillette. I'm a collections researcher. Today we're going to head into room number 16 of the Barnes Foundation. And um, it's a good thing that we're doing this digitally today because we're going to be looking at a very small image in the very edge of the display over here. Here we go. And of course, we'll zoom in into the um, individual picture in just a second, but it is a scene from a late medieval manuscript made about the year 1480 by the French royal or court painter Jean Bourdicon. And before we zoom in, I'd like to note that it comes from the same manuscript, A Book of Hours, as its neighbor over here. Um, as well as we're going to zoom across the rest of the room as well as this scene over here of, um, of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven. And on this east wall of room number 16, it is grouped together with a whole bunch of things, um, perhaps maybe especially this 20th century painting by um, American artist Charles Prendergast as an anchor of things ancient, medieval, modern that all seem to share a pretty similar formal vocabulary. So. Let's go on closer to our own particular image. Here we are. So um, again, it is from a late medieval book of hours, painted about 1480 by um, by the court painter Jean Bourdicon, um, who worked in Tours, and he was a student from of the workshop of the very famous painter, also very famous painter Jean Fouquet. Let me show you a picture by um, Fouquet. This is here we go. Um, perhaps the strangest and completely magnificent, magnificent, marvelous image of, um, of the Virgin and Child. This is now in Antwerp, um, surrounded by these incredibly vibrant seraphim and cherubim, cherubim that, um, that I guess look more or less to me like balloon animals. Um, I think just limpid, jewel-like rich details. So this is the workshop out of which he's coming. Let's go back. Um, and, and the text uh, was written by a scribe in Paris, and it also be, actually seems like the ornament was made also in Paris by a third hand. So what probably was happening was the text um, was written out in Paris, the ornament added, and then the whole was shipped off to tour for um, Bourdicon to paint it. And um, it is from a book of hours, which is a prayer book for the laity, modeled after the um, the divine office that monks would celebrate. And so images would go along with prayers that people would say at set hours through the day. Let's zoom on in the text for a second. What um, you may be able to see to, to an extent here in this kind of reddish purplish color says that you should pray it at the ninth hour. And then in Latin, the text, essentially asks God um, for several times to lend some aid. And finally, the scene that we're looking at is um, the presentation of the Christ child in the Temple of Jerusalem the, um, on the 40th day after his birth um, by, by the Virgin Mary um, and his father, um, his adoptive father Joseph over here, who's holding a very big candle. And so this is an episode in the Gospel of Luke. And what it says essentially is that the Virgin Mary is um, obeying Jewish laws where 40 days after birth, when she's considered um, pure, she goes into the temple for a purification rite and also um, is supposed to dedicate the firstborn son to God. So that is um, what she's doing, presenting him um, on, on an altar as if, um, as if to God. And the, it's also prescribed that the new parents would bring a sacrifice of turtle doves in a basket. So we see this lady over here holding the basket with doves. And um, and also the Gospel of Luke tells that when the um, when the Virgin Mary and Joseph brought the Christ child to the temple, the Holy Spirit led this old man, Simeon, who here um, appears in the guise of a, a priest in the temple, where this um, monk back here is even seeming to hold his like bishop's mitre, recognizes him as the son of God, um, as does actually this woman, the one who's holding the basket, a prop, um, an old prophetess named Anna, um, who's been waiting something like 80 years in, in order to be able to see um, the son of God presented in the temple. And so on one level, um, 
we see this image here presenting the historical gospel account of the presentation. But as you're able to see, it's not really taking place in Jerusalem so much as in the space of a, a church, although um, to be fair, in order to kind of make it look ancient, it seems that perhaps um, Bordicom has made the interior look a bit like the um, ancient Pantheon in Rome, um, which was by this time a church dedicated to, to Mary, but kind of shows forth the French interest in, um, in the Italian Renaissance interest in the classical world. Um, but that aside, we do have an altar um, draped with cloth that probably likewise was made in Italy, um, as you'd see often in those days. We have Simeon looking like a priest or a bishop, and then again we've got um, these monks in the background who certainly don't show up in the gospel account, do they, but seem perhaps along with the layperson saying these prayers to be um, celebrating liturgy in their own kind of realm. and. We um, certainly can't read the little book that they've got, but perhaps it's got text that mirrors the text below this image. And then likewise, um, again, we see Joseph here with his um, big old candle taper. Um, Candlemas, the presentation um, in the liturgical calendar was celebrated as Candlemas, you'd get your candles blessed for the year, and it was a way of um, celebrating Christ, bringing light in, back into the world. And sometimes even um, this liturgical event would get folded into the blessing of the throats with candles because um, it's very close to the feast today of St. Blaise, who's a patron of, um, of throats. So we have this beautiful scene that's kind of has one foot in the gospel history and another foot in the liturgy. Um, both as it's practiced in church or you as a layperson might be in your own home or might be carrying this to church. Um, going through the devotion, saying the prayers yourself, um, occupying a kind of slice of liturgical time or ritual time and the images themselves are supposed to be a kind of like springboard or incitement into a, a sort of third layer of time which is mystical not in gospel history not in the liturgical present but celebrating the eternal liturgy um, in heaven and kind of full immersion with the divine and with that said i'd kind of like to take a sec to think about this beautiful and i think we can even say enchanting um marginal ornament that surrounds our picture We've got these um, vines, these tendrils with these gold leaves and buds, flowers of different sorts, red and blue. We've got this, um, I think, not terribly intimidating man with a dragon's body, um, a very cute, endearing deer down here with bat's wings. Um, some of it, some of these flowers are occupying these like lozenge or triangle shapes. Others is just sort of free flowing around in the space and Medieval scholars of medieval art have proposed a number of ways to think about um, marginalia or um, decoration in the margins in medieval art. But there's one scholar who was writing in the year 1942 named Henri Fouquion that I think had a particularly lovely take on it. And so I'm going to read you an excerpt of what he wrote just because I think it's such beautiful writing. And so he, um, Fouquillon said that ornament has its own existence, um, so it's not necessarily marginal to the main event, and shapes its own environment to which it imparts a form. If we'll follow the metamorphoses of this form, if we'll study not merely its axes and armature, but everything else that it may include in its particular framework, then we'll see before us an entire universe partitioned off into an inf infinite variety of blocks of space. And the background will sometimes remain generously visible, and ornament will be disposed in straight woes or quincunxes. Sometimes, however, the ornament will multiply to prolixity and wholly devour the background. In other words, what I may call the system of the series, a system composed of dis um, discontinuous elements, sharply outlined, strongly rhythmical, and defining a stable and symmetrical space that protects them against unforeseen accidents of metamorphosis eventually becomes the system of the labyrinth which by means of mobile syntheses stretches itself out in a realm of glittering movement and color and so 
I love the thought that ornament itself has its own raison d'etre and defines its own realm that for you as a medieval viewer might be a place in which you can lose yourself in these prayers and really interface more with um with the mystical realm and so we've got a manuscript that kind of um, posits and divides up slices of time and space and I suppose I'll let you think what that means for you as a viewer to see this now on display in a room in a museum and also filtered into your own screen. And so that is it for today's takeout and thank you so much for watching. I'm Tom Collins, Neubauer Family Executive Director of the Barnes Foundation. I hope you enjoyed Barnes Takeout. Subscribe and make sure your post notifications are on to get daily servings of art. Thanks for watching and for your support of the Barnes Foundation.